By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have reached the semi-finals of the Urborg Lions Plains Pillage Old School Tournament in Dusseldorf, Germany. And if you haven't seen the other matches, I would really recommend you to check out the playlist. There will be a link in the comments below to the playlist where you can see all the other matches. And if you've seen all those other matches, then you've probably followed the deck of Michael. So Michael is actually in the semifinals with his white, green, and blue aggro control deck. It's really based on the Urnum uh, Geddon strategy, but it is a little, actually a whole lot different in a lot of different ways, but okay, I'll discuss it in the deck deck. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. And Michael is playing against Wilfred, and Wilfred is playing with a deck that I've called Atok Light. It's red, it's white, it's a little bit of blue. And the reason I've called it Atok Light is because he's playing with two Atoks instead of four, but still a lot of tactics kind of fit that, you know, standard Atok frame that you've got maybe in the back of your mind. But again, that's something I'm going to discuss in the deck text because I've got pictures of both of these decks. So if you're interested in that, definitely stick around because the deck texts are about to start. If you want to go straight to the actual action, to the games themselves, no problem. Check the description below and there you will find a timestamp entitled MTG Games. So click on there, that will take you straight to game number one. Here we are going to start with the deck deck and I'm gonna start with the deck of Wilfred, the player that's sitting on the left with red, white and blue Atok Light. And here we see the deck of Wilfred, a player from the Netherlands, by the way. And uh, as I said before, I've called it Atok Light. You can see the two Atoks there in the middle on top of the two Suchis. And if we look further at this deck, this is really an aggressive deck. We've got four Savannah Lines. We've got the blue power there. If you can see, there's a balance and there the other, the other three cards are the blue power cards. So Ancestral Recall, Time Twister and uh, Time Walk. So I think both of these players are playing powered. You also see a Black Lotus here. You see uh, the three Moxen that correspond with the colors that he's playing because he's playing blue, white, and red. So mainly white and red, uh, you could say. And he's playing, of course, with that white control package. And this is something that both players have. So both players actually have a lot of solutions. But let's just, you know, focus on, on this Atok Light Brew for now. We see three Swords to Plowsiers, three Disenchants, a single Psionic Blast. So all these cards can solve problems for you. And we also see... Uh, Wheel of Fortune here, we see two Disintegrates, so no Fireballs in this deck. You see Disintegrate is kind of slightly winning it from Fireball in the old school meta. The main reason for that is that there are usually not that many creatures on the table. There are not a lot of Swarm strategies. And this Disintegrate also removes the creature in a format where you have Regeneration creatures being pretty strong, especially the Setch Troll, but also Animate Dead, don't under underestimate that card. That's really annoying. For example, in Robots, where they keep animating uh, back the Triskelion, so a, a Disintegrate really solves that problem. So that those are some of the reasons that you see more and more Disintegrates. Um, we also see a beautiful Chaos Orb on top of there. I, I always like a Chaos Orb that's kind of have some experience, double signed, I see. Um, of course, four Lightning Bolts, just an amazing finisher. We're probably gonna see some, some Lightning Bolt decisions in, in this matchup, I wouldn't be surprised. That's what Lightning Bolt does. And also under the Soul Ring, we actually see three Surrender Befrits. So basically what uh, Wilfred has done here is, you know, he said, I'm gonna go aggressive and I'm just gonna go for some of the best creatures in the format. One drop is Savannah Line, two drop is Atok, three drop is Surrender Befrit, four drop is Suchi. So really got that nice, um, that nice creature drops. And you, you can even look at Mishra's Factories here, four of them, also a great creature. I mean, it's mana, but it's it's also a creature that can really deal damage. And when you combine it with Atok, it's a creature, it's a pump spell, and it's a land. So talk about flexibility here. And that's probably why Mishra's Factory is such a strong card. So are there any other noteworthy cards in this deck? I think we've discussed Actually, all of them. I do see um, a full playset of Black Vices. We haven't really discussed those yet. Um, I wonder if they're going to be as useful. Of course, a Black Vice turn one can always be useful because it's basically a free Lightning Bolt if you're on the play. Um, but I think against uh, Michael's deck, which we're, we are going to look at in a minute, I think in Michael's deck, it's not going to be that useful because his deck can just go, go so 
fast. And again, there are always these weird situations, for example, after an Armageddon or something, that people are stuck with a lot of cards in hand and a Black Vice can be great. Black Vice is also kind of a great weapon against, you know, Library of Alexandria. It's, it's, it's not the best. I mean, I admit that, but it is something against card draw in a way, you could say. So this is the deck of Vilfred. Now let's go and take a look at the deck of Michael. And here we see the deck of Michael. I've called it kind of red, green, aggro control with a little bit of blue. Now, obviously you can see that really the core of this deck, probably how the deck brewing started is, you know, earn them, get them. Um, you know, I've, I've already discussed it, but I'll just quickly repeat for the people that don't know uh, what Urnum Geddon wants to do. So Urnum Geddon is a strategy where you play mana dorks and you play, um, you know, creatures with a low casting cost or, you know, like Urnum Geddon is the top. I guess in this deck, there are also two Saras, but the idea is you want to play your Savannah Lions, your, your Urnum Jinn, um, your Lanawer Elves. There's also the single Birds of Paradise, your Mox and whatever. So you just want to, get ahead on the board you want to win the tempo game just deploying a lot of creatures and then as soon as you've got more creatures or stronger creatures on the board than your opponent which could be as quickly as, as turn two you want to try to cast an armageddon as soon as possible and then there are no lands anymore in play and you can take full advantage of your stronger creatures and you can kind of see that that's one of the strategies in this deck. What I kind of like about this deck is that it's not only this one dimensional. There are some more control elements in this deck. Of course, the blue power can always get you kind of out of a squeeze. You know, if you're if you're in the corner in Ancestral Recall and Time Walk can always get you back in. We also see a Demonic Tutor and Demonic Tutor, I, in this case, you can almost count it as a third Armageddon. You know, you can really use it to find an Armageddon if need be, but you can also look up your time walk for maybe a second combat step because this creature, this this deck wants to mainly kill the opponent with combat damage, right? That's the main strategy. Yes, you have Stormseeker, which I think is fantastic that you're playing with that, Michael. Um, so that can, you know, be the nail in the coffin for the opponent, but most of the damage will have to be done by the creatures. Now that I'm saying this, I'm looking at one of the in more interesting creatures in this deck, the If Biff a 3-3 Flyer from the Arabian Nights with a built-in hurricane mechanic. I mean, if you don't know this card, look it up. <laughs> it, is, it is pretty good. You can do some cool stuff with this card, seriously. If you don't know it, If Biff Afrit, Arabian Nights, look it up. It's uh, it's really worth it. Um, and then we also see the same thing as with Vilfred. We see that white control package, the four disenchants, the three swords to plowsiers. Um, and then we also see two psionic blasts there in the middle. So he's playing with one more psi blast than, than Vilfred. But these games, uh, or both of these decks, I mean, have that in common, that they both have the balance, the disenchants, the swords. They both have blue power. And I think where, where Vilfred went more with, you know, the direct damage from Red, the Atok, uh, Surrender Befrits. Uh, Michael went a little bit more with... Uh, the ramping, the Armageddons, and of course, uh, the, the Sylvan Library, and also don't underestimate the Regrowth, which is an incredibly strong card, and of course, the Four Surrendum. So instead of, uh, I mean, the Four Urnum, so instead of a Surrendum of Freed, he's playing Four Urnum Jins, for example. So it's going to be quite interesting, because both of these decks are quite heavy on their white control, are quite heavy on, on creatures. They want to deal a lot of damage with creatures. I think the biggest difference here is that... Um, there is that direct damage component from um, from Wilfred, which which could be quite quite di quite harmful for Michael. But then again, Michael has an Armageddon, and I think Armageddon can can do a lot of work in this matchup. You know, we'll have to see, of course. But I think so. Talking about Michael, if you've been following the the series here, you've seen him play a lot um, online, and I just want to thank him for that because not every player is always willing to go on the live stream and, you know, feel comfortable with their matches being recorded, which I completely understand because sometimes you make a play mistake. I, I make play mistakes all the time. As, I mean, if you're following my channel, you can see that. And um, some people, and, and they're not many, but some magic players, they, they tend to look at it and say, oh man, that's such a big and stupid mistake and, and be quite negative. Uh, like I said, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. So that's not always nice. And other players assume that because um, you made a mistake and it and you benefit from the mistake that you're actually cheating. Well, I can tell you that in old school in general, there that it hardly ever happens. And and most of these mistakes are honest honest mistakes. 
Um, so I, yeah, I just want to mention that and I just want to say thank you, Michael, for playing all these games. And actually, um, this was the first time that we met each other at this tournament here in Dusseldorf. And he gave me a pretty cool uh, card, an, an altered card. So I'll show it here. This is a, um, a screenshot from my, um, uh, my Instagram. And here you can see he's actually from uh, a group, a play group that calls themselves the uh, Rhine, uh, Land, uh, Land, Rhineland uh, Avengers. And Rhineland is a region in Germany. And it's really cool. Like it says, thanks for the talking. So uh, I really appreciate that, man. And uh, I got it here. Uh, in my, I want to say office, but it's just it's just a room in my house. But let's call it an office. That sounds really fancy. So uh, thank you, Michael, for that. So just a little shout out to your playgroup, Rhineland Adventures. I'm looking forward to see you in uh, in other tournaments. If we can finally meet again in person, you know that's not really happening at the moment. Um, so now let's get back at your deck. Um, Icy manipulators. We haven't talked about those one. One of my favorite cards, because I'm sorry, I kind of like cards that give me options, and Icy Manipulator gives a lot of options. Also really good in combination, again, with using an arm again and then having the Icy Manipulator to tap, for example, the mana rocks down. So that can be quite useful. So this is the deck of Michael. Enough talk. Let's go to the games and see how this is going to turn out. Let's go to game one. Game number one here in the semi-finals in Dusseldorf, Germany. And both players rolling the dice to see who is on the play for this matchup. Both of these decks performed really well in this tournament. I believe in the Swiss rounds, both of them went uh, had four wins and one loss. And let's see how Wilfred can, can start. And obviously they both won their quarterfinals, hence they are here in the semis. And well, look at that, Plains into Savannah Lions. More action even. Cracking of the Black Lotus. Oh, oh, oh what a brutal opener here. And is Wilfred already winning the game with this crazy opener? Because that Ancestral Recall, man, that was good. And of course, he still has that Chaos Star. But look at this. Michael starting here with a Library of Alexandria. Talking about broken cards. There is a Mox Emerald into a Birds of Paradise. And I do believe that he now still has six and a half. So that means next turn it uh, he can activate the Library of Alexandria again. And it's going to be interesting here for Wilfred. He's got some decisions to make here. Will he flip the Chaos Orb on the Library of Alexandria, for, ex for instance? And will we also see a classic play, a Bolt the Bird? That's something that's been happening for more than 25 years. So will we see a Lightning Bolt on the Birds of Paradise? Or is he simply going to pass turn? Looking at his hand. And he's really in the tank here. You know, his deck has a lot of like cheaper spells. It has quite a low mana curve. So I am expecting something here. Um, you know, Vice, Disenchant. Okay, here we go. There's a Black Vice. And maybe this could be a reason for Wilfred not to use the Chaos Orb on the Library of Alexandria. So there we see Michael taking some damage here. Two damage, drawing card number seven. Probably going to draw, there we see drawing card number eight. And what is he going to do now? I do think I see a Black Lotus as well here in Michael's hand. There's a duel. Tapping two here. What are we going to see? Maybe a Sylvan Library? Untapping now. Clear, cl uh, clearly, excuse me, <laughs> he's, uh, he's in the tank here. Trying to figure out what to do. Of course, take a zip of beer first. And pointing out the Chaos Orb in his hand. This could be quite interesting. Is he gonna play the orb here and maybe flip it on the Chaos Orb of Wilfred? Probably not, but he can play the orb so that in response of Wilfred's flip, he could use it. But now he's played the Black Lotus, tapping his Mox, playing a lot of elves. What is he going to do next here? Tapping two. And there we see the Chaos Orb. Interesting here, interesting. And we don't see an activation of the Orb from Wilfred in the end of turn, because that's something that he could have done, flipping directly on the Chaos Orb of Michael, um, because Michael's tapped out right now. He can, he can still do it, of course. And I do know that Michael has that Black Lotus, but then he has to decide, because when, when Wilfred activates his Chaos Orb, he can decide if he wants to activate his. Oh, interesting, an Atok. This game is getting... 
quite interesting here. And I have to say, I kind of was expecting uh, Wilfred maybe to be a little bit more ahead after that incredible start. But don't forget the start of Michael, of course, finding that Library of Alexandria. And um, it looks like he didn't take any damage. So he doesn't have a lot of cards in hand anymore. We do see a Sylvan Library now in the hand of Michael. Is that the card that he's going to cast? And I think Wilfred here is saying, wait a minute with playing anything out. Maybe I want to do something in response. And there's an Icy Manipulator. Interesting. Michael can still play out a land if he wants to. I think he's kind of gone away from the Library of Alexandria plan. And I think that's a good decision. I mean, he's only on 14. And there's a Bayou playing his land for the turn. I wonder what he's going to do. He could decide to crack the Lotus and play the Sylvan Library. And maybe use the last mana to activate his Chaos Orb, for example. Then again, he can also just decide to tap his two lands for the Sylvan and keep his, his Black Lotus open in case Wilfred does something. Or just pass turn, of course. And look at this end step. I believe there's an activation from the Chaos Orb of Wilfred. And in response, he's going to activate his Chaos Orb. Now, the way this works, it's last in, first out. So that means that uh, the orb flip of Michael is the one that will happen first. But I think Wilfred is saying, you know what? I'm aiming at your Chaos Orb, so you don't actually have to respond. Pretty interesting. And that's, that's kind of the discussion now. I wonder, or is he going to flip? Does Michael want to flip on something else? That would be interesting. Maybe on the ATOC? But he has an IC, he can just tap the ATOC. That's not, not really a big problem. He is on 14. I mean, it's interesting. What is he going to do? Okay, so he's untapping. He's saying, you know what? You're going to flip on the orb, so I'm just going to leave it. And here we see Wilfred. And, oh, I think that's not a full flip. It's not a full flip. Remember, it has to rotate 360 degrees. And this is not a full flip. So that means that Wilfred's orb is gone and this could be, oh, and there we see a flip on the ATOC. And I guess, is this a correct flip? I mean, it goes so quickly. I guess this is a correct flip. Wow. Okay. Now, now things all of a sudden are looking really bad for Wilfred. And remember his crazy opener. And now he only has a black vice. And okay, at least there's a disenchant on the icy manipulator. That's something, of course, in response, he's going to tap down the Savannah lines. Interesting here. There we see an untap by Michael. So the disenchant kind of helped a little bit, but it's not looking great after that missed flip for, for Wilfred here. Dog, oh, earn him gin. Let's see, does he have an answer for this? 4-5 powerhouse here. It is going to give the Savannah line a forest walk though. There is that Sylvan library we saw earlier. But of course, the Savannah line doesn't have Forest Walk yet. He will just have to wait for that to happen. And Wilfred needs to find an answer. Although he's still on 20, he's got time. Michael's on 14. This has proven to be quite an interesting opening game. Both players with two cards in hand. It looks like Wilfred's going to play something for four here. What could it be? Okay, Suchi. Interesting. He could then even choose to double block next turn, but I wonder if Michael actually wants to attack. Well, we'll just have to see. Of course, uh, Michael has that Sylvan Library. That's going to give him some advantage, and this is the first time that he's going to look at his top three cards, so it's always the best at the start. Now, he is on 14, so, I mean, this is kind of risky in a way. You could say, okay, just draw an extra card you could to 10, it's okay. On the other hand, you are playing against a player who's also playing with a lot of burn. So it's kind of risky. He does have that Urnum Gin, of course, to block with. Maybe let me know in the comments what you would do. Would you, in this situation, would you draw an extra card? And I guess Michael is not doing it. It's just gonna select one of the cards, putting it in his hand. And tapping now for three here. 
No deciding not to. He's cracking the lotus instead. Interesting. I wonder what's going to come then. So cracking it for three. We don't know what color yet. We'll just have to see what he's going to cast. And there is a time walk. Okay. Okay, so he's got one blue floating. And there's a side blast on the Suchi. So he's going to go to 12. Attacking it with the 4 5. Probably will see the block by the Savannah Alliance. Or is he going to. No, he's deciding to take the damage first. Okay, so taking the damage, going to 16. I mean, it's. He, Still got a really high life total, and then it looks like Michael's taking his other turn. Of course, he already knows what he's going to draw because of that Sylvan. Or at least knows two out of the three cards. There's a block with the Lions. Tapping for four. Armageddon! Oh, we saw this earlier. And with earlier, I mean in the previous game that Michael played, a really well-timed Armageddon. And, uh, oh man, that is going to give Wilfred a great advantage. And he's now high-fiving Michael here, kind of. And Michael is taking damage here because he's choosing to draw an extra card with that Sylvan. Going to swing in here for 5, so he's going to go to 11. Interesting choice to take extra damage, to be honest. I guess it's safe. He's on 8. That means that Wilfred will have to draw 3 Lightning Bolts in a row. And things are looking very bad here for the Atok player. And we really see the Armageddon doing work here in this first game. There's his Savannah line, slamming it on the table, attacking for another five, going to five measly life. And that's it. Vilfet saying, you know, you got this. There's nothing I can do. I cannot save myself. So this was game number one. Both players are now going to dig into their sideboards. And we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two is about to start here with Michael still sitting on the left. Or sorry, on the right, of course, and Wilfred sitting on the left. And this is business now for Wilfred. He has to bring his A game to the table if he wants to win this match. And keep an eye on the prize winning the tournament here, the Urborg Alliance Plains Pillage. This is the semifinals. Wilfred is behind. That means Michael is in the lead but it's not looking great for Michael here because he has to take a mulligan. So that's good news for Wilfred, who's going to try to uh, to win this second game, make it 1-1, and then we'll go to a decider, but we're not there yet. Let's first see how things are going to unfold here in game number two. I see a Savannah Lines in the hand of Michael, and of course he has to put a card on the bottom of the library from that seven because he took a mulligan here. And I believe it's Wilfred here on the play. Yeah, okay, yeah, because we see Michael wants to start here, but I think Wilfred's pointing out, I'm the guy uh, that gets to start. I lost that first game. And playing a Mishra's Factory, tapping it here, bringing in a Black Vice, and now it's kind of unfortunate for Wilfred that Michael had to take that mulligan. And uh, at least it means two damage here for Michael. So he's going to drop to 18. And a pretty, a pretty solid start here from, uh, from Wilfred. Look at this opener here. Crazy. We see a Mox. We see a Black Lotus and a City of Brass. I wonder what's going to happen next. Maybe you turn one Urnum? That would be interesting. Of course, you always have to risk if, if you do a play like that because you are playing against an opponent that, that packs white. So has Swords to Plows here. So you just get a Swords. And that means you basically have been two for one because you're sacking your Lotus to do that. So it looks like Michael was just kind of emptying his hand to make sure he didn't take any more damage from the vice. I mean, he's still in 18. It so it looks pretty good. I wonder if Wilfred is going to decide to attack here with the Mishra's Factory. The risk, of course, being running into a disenchant by Michael. I wonder if that's uh, if that's going to be his play, or maybe he has better options. Looking at his hand right now, deciding what to do. I think uh, a plateau would be quite nice, having red and white as his mana options here. Already having the blue on the table. Maybe also a land and a surrender per free. That would be quite good. And that's exactly what's happening here. A surrender per free. 
Three, four flyer from Arabian Nights, a powerhouse. I believe it sells, so sign there. Will we see some action here, a response by Michael? He's got some options here, of course, to get rid of a creature. He's got Swords to Plows here, but also has a Psyblast in his deck as well. It's perfect to Psyblast this creature. But then again, it would mean that he would have to sack his Lotus. I don't think you really want to do that. Drawing a card, is that? It's hard to see. It looks like a white card there. Does he have another land to play? I think that's kind of important. It looks like he's just passing turn here. And okay, sacking it for white mana, having three left, playing a disenchant. Interesting move here by Michael, kind of getting rid of a mana source and of a creature. Not too bad, of course. But he is losing the Black Lotus as well in the process. There we see a Volcanic Island from Wilfred. And now he's going to attack with two because he's like, okay, you've already played out your, your Disenchant. There's not a really big chance that you have a second one in your hand. And it looks like he's right. I don't think it's happening here. Michael already took the damage. Going to go down to 16. And it's going to take his turn. Draw. He needs some land here. He's really light on land in the second game. What is he going to do? And there is a balance. Okay, this kind of explains his play earlier. Being so aggressive with playing out two of those cards. So playing a balance, he only has one land. Remember, the Mox, of course, is an artifact. And the nice thing about balance, it doesn't include artifacts. Is creatures, lands, and hand size. So this is a pretty good deal for Michael. And of course, after that, he's going to play a Savannah and into a Savannah Lions. Very flavorful here, Michael. Nice. I can see what you did there. <laughs> there is a Mishra's Factory from... Uh, from Wilfred. It's not too bad, but again, things are kind of looking tough here. Although it's not too bad. He can just take the damage. I think both players have three cards in hand, so it's still everybody's game here. Ooh, yeah, this is pretty brutal. Ancestral Recall, such a strong card. One blue mana, instant speed, three cards. Insane. What did White get? A healing solve. I mean, it's just not, what were they thinking? Okay, wow, strip mine, stripping a land here. And I think that um, Wilfred is pointing out here, man, look at all the mana sources in my graveyard. And you're absolutely correct. We can here see, really see the, uh, the strategy from Michael and it, it, it's working out so far. Has that Savannah lines in play? Just played the Ancestral Regal. So it's got some cards in hand as well. What can Wilfred do? At least he's finding another land, so that's something. And he's just passing turn here. That's not what you want to do in the semifinals of a tournament. There is a Mishra's Factory attacking here for two. And uh, yeah, just taking the damage there. It was kind of like pretending he was going to cast uh, Swords. Didn't happen. Oh, Demonic Tutor. What is he going to tutor for? I think a regrowth on Ancestral Recall. Or is he going to get something else? Maybe, I wonder, perhaps an Armageddon to just get rid of the lands and try to win it with his Lion? Interesting. Do I see a Time Walk there? There's another land. So I guess, I guess here, Wilfred is really saying, I don't think you've taken the Armageddon. There is a Psyblast, so it was not a Time Walk, I think it was probably a Psyblast in hand of Wilfred here. And he's going to drop to 16. Again, interesting to play the, the interesting choice to play the Psyblast in his own main phase. He could have waited, of course. Okay, there we see an Urnum. I, I still wonder, maybe he first wants to deploy the Urnum and then play an Armageddon. I really wonder if you looked up the Armageddon. I'm, I'm sure we're going to find out. A regrowth would be an option as well. Regrowth, Ancestral Recall. There is a Suchi now on the board. 
And this is what makes the Urnum Gin so fantastic. It is a 4-5. That 5 toughness, seriously, I've been in so many situations where you're like, man, why does it have 5 toughness? So you probably see the same thing here. Uh, Wilfred cannot trade. He simply will have to take the damage here. I mean, he can chump block, but he's still pretty high on life. You're not going to do that. So he's going to drop to 12. And let's see what else he can do. And that's why it's a good thing, by the way, to play with a Timmy, because a Protocol Sorcerer can do that extra point of damage to kill the Urnum. There we see the regrowth. And now I wonder what he's going to pick up. Going to pick up a Disenchant, and he's going to Disenchant the Suchi. Does he really... Is he going for that line? Because, I mean, the Suchi is not really a big problem. I mean, yes, he's on 13, but he's putting more pressure on on uh, on Wilfred here anyway. Wilfred's already on 12. But, oh, it's another, it's a Demonic Tutor. He's going to play Demonic Tutor again. That is so funny. That is so interesting. Well, is he going to play it again? He's going to get it back. Take it down. Oh, he's going to play Time Walk. That's so interesting. This whole, this regrowth kind of, it's, it, it, it's very interesting. I wonder what he has in hand. Does he have something now in hand to, so he's going to attack here. So he's going to go to eight. And what else is he going to do? He's going to play Demonic Tutor. Okay. Because that's the card he got back with the regrowth i wonder what he's gonna do i mean he has a plan that's for sure take a damage tap four and now he plays that arm again and okay <laughs> oh man it's so it's really nice to see how michael is kind of sequencing this and how he he probably like changed his mind after the lines was taken care of so, oh, I guess it's over already. Okay, um, Wilfred is saying, I'm not going to win this anymore. You got it. And there was a time walk in his hand. He actually had a pretty, pretty good two cards there with the Savannah Alliance and a time walk. But I think in both of these games, we could see the incredible strength of a well-timed Armageddon. Armageddon is definitely the MVP here. And we already saw Ar Ar Armageddon doing great work in the quarterfinals. I don't want to give away too much if you haven't seen the match, but I would definitely recommend you to go check that out as well because you can really see Michael's deck in full action there as well. But what a nice uh, match here. Here we see uh, Michael's deck one more time and we will see Michael in the finals of the Urborg Lions Plains Pillage. So wow, congratulations, Michael, on reaching the finals. And uh, Wilfred, also, you've done very well at this tournament, reaching uh, not only top eight, but getting all the way to the top four. That's quite an accomplishment for an interesting ATOC uh, brew. Um, and for you, thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can do that. Actually, you already did that by looking at this video. So thank you very much for that. If you're another subscriber, please subscribe. It really helps the channel. It shows YouTube that you appreciate the content that I make. Um, and also, you can leave a like, leave a comment, share this match on your socials if you've enjoyed it and you want more people to see it. What you can also do is click a notification bell. Apparently, that really helps as well and then you will be notified as soon as i'm putting another match online talking about that i update three times a week on the tuesday the friday and the sunday so keep an eye on the channel a lot of updates happening every single week and you can also become a sponsor of the show almost forgot about that you can become a patron of timmy talks and you can join all the fun on our discord server there's probably a link popping up right now click on that link and you can see how you can join Timmy Talks, and also how you can support and sponsor the show that way. Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing, awesome patrons of Timmy Talks.
Ik het als ik het als zomba kan zien.